So good morning. Um, thanks for coming. There was a little bit of a concern that no one would show up the first time we tried this, so <laughs> super excited that worked out. Um, so what I'm going to do is some quick introductions, and then we'll tell you what we're doing and why we're doing it. And then we're going to get into a discussion about the state of our budget, um, some labor workforce updates, Lean Six Sigma, purchasing, um, and then we'll leave time for questions for you guys, uh, whatever you want to ask. I will say that we have the, the budget, labor, and purchasing folks here, so if you have questions that are outside of that, I'll probably have to work with you separately to get you the right person, but we'll get to that. So, the one person that you'll notice may be missing or is missing is uh, one Mr. Ryan Alsop, our fearless leader. He, uh, <laughs> he came down with the flu, and I think for everybody's health and safety, it's best that he stay where he is. Um, so, first, we have Miss Nancy Lawson. Uh, she is our Assistant County Administrative Officer. She is the queen of all things budget, and in my beautiful storytelling per the Justice League, she is our Wonder Woman. <laughs> um, then we have Mr. Devin Brown, our Chief Human Resources Officer, otherwise known as the, I'm going to get it wrong, Chief Disruptor of the Human Resources Universe. That's correct. Yes. <laughs> okay. So he's, he's a very important individual. Uh, and then we have Mr. Jeffrey Hill, or Jeff Hill. Uh, he's our Director of General Services. Do I have that right? Yeah? Okay. Uh, and I can't, oh wait, and Devin is, he's our Batman. And then I cannot decide if Jeff is Flash or Green Lantern. <laughs> This is news to me, so I <laughs> So I'm still trying to figure that out. He's uh, very outdoorsy and more likely to uh, probably get struck by lightning than the rest of us. <laughs> and, uh, but he also oversees the crew of people that can build almost anything. So uh, Green Lantern would be appropriate as well. Uh, in the room, we have a couple of our budget folks. We have Ms. Elsa Martinez, who um, is probably going to fillet me for doing that. That's all right. We have some of our interns um, as well and our faithful team from Kega. So, uh, so here's what we're doing today, again. Excuse me. Um, how the county manages our tax dollars is critically important. And one of the things that's really important to Ryan and his whole leadership team is that we're more transparent and that we're bringing our residents along for the ride, that we're, that we're kind of bringing them into the process and making it more open and easy to understand. Um, so, one of the most effective ways to do that is to give you guys access to all of us at one shot rather than trying to uh, get little pieces from each person along the way. So we've put a panel together, so hopefully it makes it easy for you guys. If it goes well, uh, if it's a good use of your time, and my colleagues are still talking to me tomorrow, um, we'll try it again for other topics. You know, as we make our way through the budget, budget process, we'll do more of it. Um, and we can do it for other things as well. So here's hoping that we're all on speaking terms tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna start. Nancy, um, if you could just give us a high level view of our current budget status. Sure, so we've just started our budget uh, process for fiscal year 2018-19. Uh, in February, the board uh, approved, on February 27th specifically, the board approved uh, what we call our guidelines. So that's the number that each department is going to use to develop their budgets that are due by April to this office. Um, with that, we do a preliminary projection of what we anticipate the deficit to be. We're right in a four-year mitigation plan that started in fiscal year 1617. Uh, to resolve a deficit that was about $44.6 million. That's now down to $12.6 million, so we resolved about 72% of that, uh, which is obviously heading in a very um, positive direction and exactly where we were expecting it to go. We've been using um, less reserves than we initially anticipated uh, by about $12 million, and the reductions that we were expecting to take at the onset of the uh, deficit is, has uh, declined from 12%, I'm sorry, about 16% down to about 12% that we're anticipating now. Uh, we proposed a 2.5% reduction for uh, our what we call the net general fund costs that departments um, are able to spend going into next fiscal year. 
uh, six and a half million dollars, or about half of what the deficit is that is remaining. Um, we're uh, in a little bit different situation with our fire fund. Um, our fire fund is um, actually seeing an increase in uh, the deficits that, that is projected. Uh, last year they were about $8.5 million and now we're about $10 million. That's a preliminary projection. And our estimates will change as we get closer to the year end uh, as we have the final ass assessment roll from the um, assessor reporter and our final year end balance of the reports. Okay, so you and I and Ryan were talking the other day and you explained this to me uh, in a really kind of interesting way. We're doing some things differently. So I think from a long-range philosophy standpoint, can you kind of walk us through that and what the county's doing different that other counties aren't? Sure. Uh, one of the things that we did about five to six years ago was migrate from depending on one-time resources to fund our o overall operations. So the philosophy is, is that um, if you want an ongoing source in order to cover your ongoing expense. Uh, and so what we did was um, uh, participate in a um, program that um, won us an award. It's a distinguished budget presentation award from uh, an agency called GFOA, Government Finance Officers Association. And where the best practice is, is to establish, develop, and implement policy um, guide how your uh, board spends their money. And so one of the big components of that was that uh, we would be a county that uh, focuses on using one-time sources for one-time expenses, uh, which has uh, been in, taken us a couple of years to get there. Um, but it's been pivotal in helping us through this deficit uh, times where now we have enough reserves uh, to cover our mitigation plan over a four-year period, and then we're able to resolve that and we're back to having ongoing sources for ongoing operations, and we were then um, structurally stable um, from a fiscal perspective. Awesome. Okay, so kind of in that line, um, compensation or total compensation is a big part of our budget, um, and it's, it's a growing number even though we're not seeing uh, raises to our folks, but Devin, can you can you talk to that piece of the budget a bit? Sure, that, and, that dynamic as well. And like <clears throat> like you said, Megan, it is a huge part of our uh, our overall budget and the the expenses that we have here with the county because we have a workforce of over seventy five hundred employees that work all across the county in different uh, departments, whether it's the fire department or sheriff or here in this office in this building. Uh, doing any number of things for the county. Uh, and what comes with that is salaries uh, and benefits. Uh, so what we have, you know, it's kind of a, a you know, we have a, a pretty cool graphic of this, of how that's translated over the last nine years, since 2009. Uh, salaries have pretty much remained constant <coughs> uh, around $480 million uh, to about now, I think, a, a little bit over $500 million. Um, for the for the county as a whole, uh, but what has grown it, on top of that is the cost of providing the benefits that we do. Uh, you know, we, we negotiate labor contracts with our employees, and part of that is public pensions. Part of it's uh, health and welfare benefits uh, that we have here, and, and we've seen those two costs grow significantly over that same nine year period. Um, so what, what's difficult is is to have those conversations with our employees and really get them to understand, okay, well, we aren't able to give um, those in-the-pocket uh, salary increases that you're looking for because our costs have increased so much. It's gone up about $111 million in that nine-year period, which is about a 50% increase in uh, retirement and health benefit costs. And when we translate to that, to what that equivalent, equivalent uh, the equivalent salary increases, it's about 17% over that same year. So if we were able to plug that same $110, $111 million into our employees' pockets, that's, that's what it would roughly work out to be is about a 17% salary increase. So it's difficult uh, when revenue is decreasing and uh, we're talking about budget uh, deficits and structural deficits to, um, and on top of that, still having to pay those 
um, negotiated costs uh, for retirement and healthcare benefits. It's difficult to, to work in salary increases, so we've had to be really creative uh, with our employees and try to get them to understand, build that level of trust with them, and, and, um, and really build to a, a bridge to a better future. Okay, so you mentioned something about um, we're negotiating our contracts with our employees. So can you give us an update on the, the latest and greatest of all things labor negotiations? <laughs> so when I took over this job, uh, I think it was about 2014, we had all of our labor contracts were going uh, to be expiring within a year. Um, Did they so tell you that when you took the job? <laughs> I, I knew. <laughs> uh, I'm a glutton for punishment. So, um, uh, but that happened at the same time where we're, we're seeing the oil uh, shortfall uh, come in um, in late 2014, early 2015, and then again the next year. Uh, so we had to adopt kind of a, a unique strategy with our groups um, of, of really approaching it with these short-term contracts, um, trying to work through each budget year to make sure that uh, we could address some of the needs that they uh, were looking to have, but maybe not everything. Uh, that we, they wanted us to do for them, which, which mostly is the salary increase piece. Uh, we just inked a two-year deal with SEIU, our largest um, employee association, uh, in December. Uh, so that carries us through October of, of 2019. Uh, and we're uh, getting into labor negotiations with some of our public safety unions, our, our fire union, our deputy sheriff's uh, association, and our uh, detention officers association. So we're still trying to bridge during this four-year um, fiscal plan uh, to get to the end of it. Like SEIU uh, is, is at the tail end of that plan, their contract will expire. Um, so we're, we're looking to kind of do a similar thing with some of our public safety uh, associations in the next few months. Very cool. Thank you for the update. Okay, so while we're on contracts, Jeff, uh, your division response is responsible for um, all the fundings that the county gets to purchase our buying power. Um, so can you talk to us about how you manage that? How do you manage our, our buying power? Um, yeah, thank you, Megan. Uh, the policy and procedures manual as well as government code require certain um, uh, constraints on our purchases. Uh, so we're not buying a baseball team anytime soon? So we're not buying a baseball team anytime soon, uh, unless it's a competitive bid for that baseball team. <laughs> Um, we, we're required to, uh, uh, for most purchases, perform a competitive process. Uh, our purchasing department uh, purchases over $100 million worth of goods and services uh, every year, uh, on average. This past year was $86 million. And most of those purchases are done through a competitive process. This affects the overall county budget in that when we do a competitive process for those goods and services, um, all departments benefit. So if there's a purchasing agreement or a price agreement out there that we have competitively bid and is on the average 20% less than had we not um, done a competitive process, that saves 20% 20, 20 um, uh, of its cost avoidance, not necessarily savings, but its cost avoidance. So our purchasing department um, division uh, manages all of those goods and services purchase orders. Um, uh, we also focus on pushing many purchases, very low dollar purchases, to credit cards as has been reported on before. Um, we look to see most of our small purchases through purchasing uh, cards because the cost of administering those purchases and payments is significantly lower than the cost for administering price agreements and purchase, uh, purchase orders. So we do a good job of making sure that all departments benefit um, through, uh, through those price agreements and the management of them. Additionally, um, uh, we're, we're sort of piloting a program of, 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 uh, of entering into, uh, we have entered into an agreement with an office services supply company that uh, that standardizes the available purchases for departments. And we, we expect um, a 25% reduction in overall cost for those office supplies 
and um, we're tracking those costs as we're going. It's a new, it's a new program. Uh, all departments are, are invited uh, to participate, and we look to see reductions in costs for all departments related to that. Very cool. Thank you. Okay. So <coughs> that is a nice little segue to some more um, activities that we're doing here at the county where we're trying to get creative in how we find ways to be more cost effective and efficient. And so originally this question was meant for Ryan, but Devin, you're, you're going you're gonna to play Ryan for a minute and talk to us about Lean Six Sigma and sure. what that is, where it came from, why does the county feel like this is... Put my Lean Six Sigma hat on. Yes. Um, so that is another thing that uh, the Human Resources Division uh, sort of kicked off for the county was uh, a Lean Six Sigma project back in uh, 2015 in 2016, and it's still an ongoing uh, philosophy in, in the division and throughout the county now. Uh, so what Lean Six Sigma really is, it just boils down to getting faster and better uh, with what we do here. Uh, so that's uh, allowing our employees uh, and uh, our county departments to find creative new ways to approach their work, uh, cutting waste full steps out of the process, uh, and, and really providing quicker services to the, the public and better, hopefully, and making them more consistent over and over again so that we're continually, continuously improving on what we do. Uh, so we've developed a, a culture of innovation uh, here uh, with Kern County and our Lean Six Sigma training and development is a, a major portion of, of that building that culture. Um, so what we've been able to do over the last uh, year is, is train our leadership here at the county on what Lean Six Sigma is and how that can uh, enhance the services their departments uh, provide to the public, uh, how they can build that culture within their um, departments and, and really store, create that story for the county. Uh, we, so we've uh, trained up over 200 um, county leaders and now we're kind of on to the next secondary phase which is uh, teaching our staff, uh, our line staff, uh, what it means to, to get involved in Lean Six Sigma projects, uh, developing quick wins, which we've kind of labeled the, these uh, ideas that you'll come up with that sitting at your desk of just how, how to make simple changes to, to improve your process. And uh, it, it's been great so far. We've had a lot of participation in that program countywide. Uh, we're also uh, developing what we call our green belt teams. Um, the Lean Six Sigma community really uh, uses the um, black belt, green belt, um, martial uh, arts kind yeah, of. martial arts theme throughout. Uh, so you'll see that a lot. It's like um, government jujitsu. So we're starting with our our green belt teams, uh, and um, our our one of our employees here, Jason Weeby, is is head headlining that uh, project, and and so we have these. Uh, Greenbelt teams de developed uh, to go out and, and do major project overhauls with uh, in the county, and so we're working on training the, that Greenbelt staff right now as well. So we've uh, done a lot in a year, um, and really I think uh, everything that we do, even with what Jeff was talking about with the contracts and, and finding um, enhancements in that area is, is, is all part of that. Um, finding creative ways to save some money not a whole lot of money, uh, but it's also to provide better services for our residents. Awesome. Okay, so Jeff, I'm going to come back to you because your department has done some pretty slick um, Lean Six Sigma stuff. And uh, I believe we are in the car business, from what I understand, maybe. So help, help us all understand what um, some of the things that your department's done around cars recently. <clears throat> so previously, uh, well, and, and currently, um, the County General Services Division of CAO manages the fleet for 800 vehicles that are vehicles used by many, many departments. There are some departments that the CAO's office doesn't manage the fleet of, but of the 800 that we, uh, that we do manage, um, our our team of uh, the, our division chief and our purchasing manager have uh, in investigated uh, an agreement with Enterprise Fleet Management to no longer purchase our vehicles but to lease them. 
uh, the leasing of those vehicles, our estimate at this stage of the game for uh, only a fraction of our fleet. Right now it's a pilot program. It's 111 vehicles. It's vehicles for general services as well as vehicles for behavioral health. They have partnered with us in this pilot program. Uh, it's 111 vehicles. We expect to save in the coming fiscal year $375,000 in uh, an overall cost of purchase maintenance um, uh, of the vehicles. The, there, are, there are additional benefits to that as well. Um, <clears throat> we're going to get newer vehicles that have better safety options. They're better appointed and have uh, more technology uh, on board with them. Uh, they have better fuel mileage. So there will be additional benefits, some that have real costs. In other words, if you take something that has 30% uh, higher fuel efficiency, every department that runs those vehicles will have lower cost. So we're, we're really looking forward to a good win on that. Um, we are in the next 82 days expecting to get our vehicles uh, for the first wave. This is a five-year pilot program. Uh, if it were to expand completely to all vehicles maintained uh, by the CAO General Services Fleet uh, Division, uh, we expect to see as much as a, a million and a half savings, million and a half dollar savings every year. Very likely, all the vehicles wouldn't transfer that because there's some specialized vehicles that may be, that, that may be less uh, friendly to that, uh, to that agreement. But that's just one really tangible and recent uh, um, example of that Lean Six Sigma thinking and reimagining the way that we do business. Okay, okay Devin, I'm going to come back to you and then Nancy, I want to hit you with a bunch of them. So, um, on kind of that adaptation thing, <coughs> you were talking to me the other day about how we're adapting to today's workforce. So, can you talk to me about um, kind of what you guys are doing there and then maybe you could tell us about your accolades at LinkedIn uh, gave you recently about what the chief disruptor of the human resources <laughs> universe is doing. Uh, sure. No, I think it's a, a really um, important subject to, to, to talk about um, and um, let everybody know kind of what the county is doing as an employer, because we are an employer, we're 7,500 7, plus employees like I talked about earlier. Uh, how, how are we adapting to the workforce, which is going to be 75% millennials pretty soon, which uh, I'm not a millennial. I might seem young, but I'm not. Um, but, but it's scary. So uh, how, how is, as managers, how do we adapt to that new workforce that's going to be uh, made up of, of uh, millennials and then Generation Z to follow? Um, well, the key is to adapt to them because we really can't uh, force them to adapt to us. So what does the county have to offer uh, candidates out there for jobs? Well, we have everything built in and cooked into what we do uh, here at the, at the county that, that will um, attract those millennials because every study that's ever been done says that a millennial, you know, goes to a job because they want to have a, a me purpose and meaning in, in the work that they do. Well, you can't get more purpose and meaning than um, serving the people that you live with in the community, whether it's providing them protection and, um, and public safety or fire protection or social work or behavioral health services. Uh, there, you know, there's any number of things that uh, we do here, and it's exciting to talk about, but uh, that we can use as a tool to really attract those high-level talent pools uh, and, and bring uh, more talented uh, candidates and workers into the county. Uh, so that's part of it. The other part is technology. Uh, you know, we've, uh, I, was, I was thinking about, you know, just in the last 10 years, uh, what's changed? Uh, you know, Apple just had its 10-year anniversary of the iPhone. So 10 years ago, we didn't even have an iPhone. But um, so that's where people live is on their mobile devices, whether it's the iPhone or, or tablets or anything like that. So how can we um, make ourselves more available in that kind of context uh, to candidates and applicants? So we've developed quite a number of different uh, relationships, whether it's with our applicant system uh, where they can actually go on to um, kerncounty.com and reach 
our applications and apply right there online on their tablets or phones uh, and send their application over to us to review. Or if it's uh, through LinkedIn, which has uh, got a talent pool of over 500 million um, LinkedIn members uh, who have accessed that social uh, uh, network to develop their careers and put their personal brands out there and look for jobs. So all of our jobs um, that are professional in nature are, are um, advertised through LinkedIn. We've got a partnership with that company uh, that we just uh, agreed to this past year and are, are um, getting off the ground where we can use the tools that they have, the algorithms that they have built into their, um, their network to really find candidates that meet the skill set that we want. Uh, and, uh, and again, it's, it's tailored to uh, that kind of new way of thinking and that new um, approach to job seeking out there. We, we don't want to just find people who are looking for jobs. We want to find the people that we want. Uh, we feel that best fit the mold uh, for working at Kern County. So we're able to even uh, approach candidates who may not even be looking to change jobs, but who we want to have a discussion with about coming to work for the county and changing maybe the way they um, feel about their future or their career path and, and getting that kind of new spirit here uh, in the county. So we've, uh, like I said, just kicked off this relationship with LinkedIn um, this past year and are developing it, but it's uh, given us a lot more insight into the, the workforce in general, what they're looking for, uh, and then also the candidate pools that are out there uh, that we can reach in, into and, and bring into our uh, civil service system and have as applicants to consider. So it's, it's really exciting. Um, we're one of the first major government counties that uh, is really embracing this as, as a possible avenue to find talent. Uh, a lot of private sector employers use it all the time, so we're kind of uh, at the forefront of government um, using uh, tools like these to attract talent to come and work for the county. Very cool. Um, so can you tell us, before we leave workforce stuff, can you give us a quick update on the healthcare front? Like what we're doing here for healthcare to manage that? Sure. Uh, All of that. So as I mentioned kind of at the outset of this discussion, healthcare costs have increased. Um, it's not just the county's healthcare costs, it's nationwide. Uh, healthcare costs have continued to increase over the last 10 to 15 years, and the county certainly uh, received its share of those increases. And that comes with our population being a little bit more unhealthy uh, than most, uh, and then also just the general cost of health care increasing. So uh, what we're, we're looking to do is to, again, partner with our employees and their, their groups to um, find ways to reduce cost savings. We've got uh, lower cost plan options uh, for our employees and their families to join. We've got our homegrown um, health plan here, it's called Kern Legacy. It's a, a network of local physicians, uh, hospitals, uh, who provide care for our members. Uh, and they've uh, entered into agreements with the county to provide those uh, uh, services at a reduced rate compared to some of those national plans like Anthem and uh, other uh, national plans. Kaiser is, uh, is more of a California plan, but we, uh, so we're trying to, to, to find uh, options for our employees uh, that help the county reduce costs, uh, deliver some budget savings overall, but also deliver some savings to our employees so they're not paying out of pocket uh, more because they do pay uh, a share of the cost. Uh, so those are some of the things that we're looking at. We're also, you know, we're, again, like the Lean Six Sigma, we, we can get better every day. Uh, so we're trying to continuously engage with our workforce to find uh, what works the right. best. Very cool, thank you. Okay, Jeff, really quickly. Um, um, what's the good word on parks? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of good uh, going on at parks. Um, when the CAO's office, General Services, um, got Parks Department about a year ago, um, uh, we realized that w we didn't, in some instances, know what we didn't know. And so uh, working with the CAO's office to identify ways of, of modifying the accounting so that we understood really how much we were spending where within parks was something that, was the, that is 
was and is continues to be critical. We, uh, so, so once we know where we're spending what and on what, we can then begin to manage more effectively. Um, our, our parks department uh, has, um, has uh, parks department, functional area parks, um, uh, has some challenges ahead of it. Funding is, a, um, is an issue. One of the things that we're doing with parks currently is uh, soliciting grants to help augment our current budget for parks, for, for parks improvements. Um, there are uh, a couple of different grants that we're applying for now in the, to the tune of about a million dollars if we're successful, and we think that we will be. Um, uh, also, Hart Park has become a, is, is a really, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great asset for the county, and we are paying particular attention to it, as well as all of our parks. We, you know, we have, we have uh, near about 40 parks. We have regional parks. We have uh, community parks. But Hart Park has re received a lot of attention because, um, because it, needs some, it needs some significant improvements. So the, the CAO's office has, um, has commissioned a consultant to work with our, uh, with our parks uh, planners, with our architects and engineers, and boots on the ground, um, parks operators and maintenance people uh, to identify how we ought to improve uh, Hart Park. We expect in the, in the coming months by May to have a, uh, a plan that includes contract costs, estimated construction costs, uh, areas of improvement prioritized, um, also with a focus of revenue generating improvements to help, uh, to help maintain, uh, maintain not just Hart Park, but parks in general. So we're really excited. Um, about the improvements that uh, that are planned and that we're currently making, we 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 spend a lot of money on construction projects every year for parks. Um, we continue to do that. Uh, this this improvement plan for Hart Park will be a will just be one area of focus uh, of many. So we're really excited about uh, about what's happening. Very cool. More Hart Park after dark. Uh, actually, there, there are other things that, uh, that may be in the works, nothing that can be announced at this point, but that's certainly, um, that was such a successful event. And uh, I'll go kind of back to, that is how government really should work. Um, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. Uh, I don't, you, at our last board meeting, there were over 50 people that all represented many, many departments within Kern County that all came together for that successful event. Over 2,000 people were there. It was headed up by, by Andy Sullivan now? Yes. Um, uh, by Andy Sullivan, she did a fantastic job, worked with across the board with departments. It was a, a CAO, had a very active role. Um, it was a tremendous, tremendous event. And there's no reason we can't continue to do those. Very cool, thank you. Okay, Nancy, I always feel bad that I give you the heavy <laughs> questions. Okay, so, um, in the last couple of budget conversations that we've had, we've talked about how pension is, it's a, it's a challenge. So can you help us understand that challenge and the contributing factors to that? Sure. And, I, and Devin ta talked about it briefly before about how we're seeing the escalation of the retirement costs. And there's two components primarily to that. It's the retirement contribution rates that are provided from our CASERA board or uh, uh, Kern County Employees Retirement Association. And then we also have pension obligation bonds. So we have to take those rates on what we're needing to pay uh, and combine them. And that's what the departments are charged for. Uh, so, and I'll start with the, the CASERA rate first. They, those rates are, are um, provided to us. They're calculated by actuarials. Uh, and about every three years, they will evaluate different uh, components of a, a very complicated calculation. Uh, that drives whether that rate increases or decreases, and obviously it's been increasing for us over many years. Um, they've just um, completed uh, a current one that's applying to us in the fiscal year 18-19, and some of the, the main things that are impacting us, they're changing um, uh, an assumed rate of return, essentially. They're anticipating that the, um, uh, the assets are going to actually earn less than 
Um, it has in the past, so that impacts our rate. Uh, in addition to that, mortality rates um, have changed. People are living longer, uh, so that means you're having to pay their uh, benefits for a longer period of time, and that means you have to have money going into um, the retirement system so that you have money to pay these folks for longer. Uh, so uh, that's one piece of it. The other is our pension obligation bonds. We have three pension obligation bonds um, with an outstanding amount of about five, a little over 500 million uh, that we have to make debt payments on each year. So that's about 63 million a year. The Casera portion is over about 200 million. So we have to divvy that up to all the departments and um, uh, that's how that's brought in. Um, but the pension obligation bonds specifically are, um, while we have one paying off in 2021, um, that is escalating. So the payments get larger as uh, we get closer to the end of life on those um, particular issuances. Uh, so that's what's driving our costs for, for, for retirement benefits overall up. Okay, so another question, and this, this is another one that was originally meant for Ryan, so you can draw this <laughs> short straw. Um, earlier you had talked about um, our deficit and how we've um, taken it from 44.6 down to 12.6, um, yet on the fire fund we're seeing it trend upward. Right. So can you, can you talk to us a little bit more about that and then maybe give us an update on, and that, this is kind of a Nancy Devon question, so um, what are we doing there um, as far as kind of managing that and mm -hmm. any negotiations happening that we can kind of get an update on? Okay, so, so one of the major differences between the general fund that is seeing progress we're on it. The general fund's on a four-year mitigation plan, specifically following policy that we talked about earlier on a long-term range of fixing a structural problem where you're not relying on one-time revenues to cover an ongoing expense. So we're having in the general fund departments take uh, essentially cuts each year in order to achieve that balance again. In addition to over that four-year for your time using one-time resources to fill the gap until we get to that full resolve. That's the general fund. In contrast, the fire fund is um, currently relying on a lot of one-time sources to fill their budget gap. So therefore, each year, unless you have an ongoing either additional source or an ongoing reduction of cost, that structural deficit will not go away. And typically, because, and we were just touching on pension, um, our pension costs for safety folks are more expensive. Uh, and they typically have a higher rising rate because they can, they have, and one of the components of this, and I, and I should have touched on it earlier, was that safety retirement is more expensive than our general membership because they retire earlier, so you're paying a longer time um, uh, while they're in the retirement years. So as part of that actuarial calculation, that gets, um, uh, that gets um, updated um, based on information that we have. Um, so where our progress is being seen out of the general fund and the fire fund is focusing on one-time resources, we're gonna continue to see that um, uh, increase until we find um, alternate solutions. About 87% of the fire department's budget um, of $141 million is salaries and benefits. Um, so uh, unfortunately a lot of resolve has to focus on um, that salary and benefit cost. Uh, we've um, had a consultant come in and look at um, various ways to um, find efficiencies and provided some recommendations. Um, a lot of that has to do with overtime or um, uh, negotiated type items um, associated with salary and benefits. So I don't, if um, Devin wants to you know, chime in on that, but a lot of our focus has to uh, be negotiated. Yeah, that's, uh, I will add, that's correct. It's, um, it's a challenge for the fire chief uh, who manages <coughs> that fund and the board of supervisors to find that savings when 80 per plus percent of, of the budget is, is baked into salaries and benefits um, that are negotiated as part of an MOU 
uh, that's expired and we are uh, going to start uh, discussions with the fire union uh, and really try to find a, a common ground and partnership with that, with that group of uh, employees to see if we can find at least um, like we have with SEIU, a bridge to better times uh, to help get some savings. You know, one of the things that SEIU um, negotiated with us is to change the way we uh, pay overtime. Um, there, there's a standard created by the federal government of a minimum overtime payment. Uh, and right now for the fire employees and, and other public safety uh, employees, we're paying uh, an additional amount on top of that that's been negotiated. And, and, as part of their wages for some time now. So SEIU rolled back to the, uh, the federal standard um, this December uh, and we're adapting to that. There's some challenges there too, but, um, and that's making sure that we're counting that only the actual hours that an employee works uh, as, as um, qualifying for overtime eligibility. Uh, and so right now, uh, our, our fire employees, uh, they get to count uh, paid leave time, whether it's taking a vacation uh, or sick time or uh, time they get off for a holiday, uh, that counts as, as overtime uh, uh, hours for them. So it increases those costs. They already have overtime built into their schedule um, that, that is just generally the practice of, of uh, fire employees because they're 24 hour employees. Uh, so we're looking at, at, at uh, bringing that change along to our public safety um, groups as well. Uh, that was one of the recommendations by the consultant who um, we had a, a report on coming at, to the board this January. Um, and uh, they also looked at uh, some of the other special pays that we um, provide our fire employees and whether those are necessary, whether they should be qualifications of the job and uh, right. really be a part of their base salary instead of these special enhanced pays. Uh, you know, it's going to be, uh, uh, require a little sacrifice on, on both parts. Uh, maybe it's going to require the county to, to come up with some new creative ways to enhance uh, their work experience uh, in exchange for some of those items. But really, when, if, if we're able to uh, even get a portion of that structural deficit paid off through some sort of negotiated um, uh, change with our fire employees. That only helps all the rest of the employees because right now every dollar that, of that deficit that's not uh, resolved is coming from uh, other sources, the general fund most likely. So that impacts us all. Yeah. Uh, and all of the services that the county uh, provides because uh, every dollar that we can't spend on uh, child welfare or uh, or, or any other type of service that we have, whether it's sheriff, it, you know, that, that counts and that matters. So we need to, to correct this problem. And, and so we are working with that, that union uh, to do that. Cool. Thanks for the perfect segue, by the way. That life and life line worked mm -hmm. quite nicely. Okay, so speaking of services, um, this is kind of for the group, but Jeff, I'm gonna start with you because in a conversation we had the other day, you said something that kind of, it sounded really cool, so. Now you're stuck with it. Wow. Um, <laughs> with our four-year <coughs> mitigation plan, we're heading into year three, currently in year two. We've taken step downs every year. Um, so my question is, as a result of that, what services have we had to cut? General services has not had to cut any services uh, really whatsoever. What we have, what this has done is forced us to find creative ways, uh, I say forced us to, we should be doing that anyway, but um, finding creative ways to, uh, to, re to meet our, our budgetary uh, restrictions. Um, we, we, the bottom line is that there are no services that aren't, um, that, that have been cut. So uh, some of the creative ways that we are still providing uh, good services, as an example, are the community agreements we have for, s for labor in some parks, as an example. Um, we currently have agreements with community partners that total 50,000 hours per year. And this is work that is primarily done at our parks departments around our buildings, um, work release programs. Some are voluntary, some are less than voluntary. 
Um, but uh, we have a significant amount of, uh, of labor that's provided that helps us and is directed by county staff that helps us uh, meet, uh, meet some of our demands. So general services has not, has not, uh, has not had any reduction in services. Nancy or Devin, any? Well, I, I would like to just add that that was the intent of the four-year mitigation plan was to provide management the time to plan uh, accordingly. Um, you know, one of the things that was focused on was attrition. As you know, folks are going to retire. You know, you're not going to backfill that position to help absorb the reduction that's going to be anticipated. Um, you know, implementation of all the Lean Six type activity, all of that, um, you know, giving, given over a four year period, um, by, you, by the time you get to the end, um, you've had an opportunity to um, deal with some of those things. We've had a total of about three layoffs overall in um, uh, various departments for various reasons, but the overall goal in uh, budget development from this office has always been to minimize the service level impacts. So, um, and, and giving a lot of planning time uh, for management to deal with that. So, and it's been successful. Um, we do, you know, there are certain, certain departments that we know, okay, they're getting tight each year as it gets, it gets harder for them. Uh, and um, we do uh, evaluate uh, different impacts to ensure that, um, you know, the strategies going forward are going to um, help them achieve where they need to be. Uh, and depending on what the priority is, there's no equal department. Ryan's always said that. Um, that you know, we we look at the cuts from a, a global perspective, and then we figure out where um, we need to uh, support um, so that uh, critical uh, services are going to be maintained. And I'll just add um, from the human resources division's perspective, we've uh, we've been able to shed about four positions, we have you know, about 10% of our, our total uh, position allocation over that, that period um, through attrition uh, and uh, not really seen an impact on the service level. It, it has been challenging uh, despite uh, being in this fiscal uh, climate that we're in, uh, hiring is still ongoing. We have a number of departments that are supported by other revenue sources that are hiring up significantly uh, so it, it's it's been challenging uh, uh, being able to maintain that but so far uh, with some uh, our Lean Six Sigma mentality our uh, reduction in the amount of time of our recruitment process we've been able to to make do and and, and make the changes that we need making sure we're working smarter uh, maybe not harder uh, so uh, it's 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 been really good so far awesome okay um, Megan, can I add one other thing? Yeah. Do you mind? Um, something I, I failed to mention earlier that feeds into the 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 reduction or the the lack of really reduction in uh, services, um, and it's really a Lean Six effort that we undertook with purchasing again. This is related to um, ex renegotiating existing contracts and uh, and negotiating uh, more favorable terms. We uh, have <coughs> renegotiated many, many existing purchasing agreements, price agreements, uh, for goods and services for that affect all departments. Um, this was, uh, I think, presented as one of the Lean Six Sigma uh, uh, wins, and this isn't a this is a uh, this isn't a quick win, but it's a big one, and we are seeing. Uh, we are expecting over the term of the uh, of contracts over the next three years reduction in costs direct off the bottom line of two million dollars over the next uh, over the next three years, um, uh, and that is directly related to our purchasing uh, purchasing effort and renegotiating existing contracts um, that has borne really I mean tangible fruit. That again is cost avoidance. So what that does is it allows other departments to reallocate the funds that they have, whereas they may not, they, they're able to hire another staff or they're able to do other things because they're not paying a portion of that, uh, of their budget uh, that they would ordinarily be paying. So it's another uh, great win that allows uh, uh, all departments um, in an incremental way uh, to maintain services. Very cool, thank 
you. Okay, so with that, I think that's the end of our questions, or my <coughs> questions for you. My torture's <laughs> over. Um, so we'll open it up for you guys to ask questions. Um, again, they, Nancy is our budget queen, uh, Devin is human resources, and Jeff is general services. Um, so if you have questions that they can't answer, I'll work with you afterwards to make sure we do get we get you the right person. So if you have questions, let us know. Kind of striking on the same thing you were working on. Um, Jeff, you talked about <coughs> service level impacts and general services, but is there a general feel for how much uh, service impacts uh, mitigation plan has had countywide? Uh, it varies by department. Um, depart certain departments have other funding sources than the general fund, and those tend to um, obviously be less impacted than those who aren't. Um, we have some departments that are 100% uh, net general fund uh, funded. Board of Supervisors are one, and they only have staff of like three. So it's been challenging as we've done uh, each year of the reductions, trying to um, uh, minimize those impacts, and they've just uh, they've all had to uh, rethink how they're um, doing business and um, what works best for them. I will say that definitely the length of time of which it was um, that's been imposed on them is helping. Uh, plus, they give us a lot of um, forewarning if we're going to have to address some issues. Um, we know that, for example, public safety is of um, utmost importance to the board. So if they're um, acknowledging that there's going to be um, a challenge for them, then we, tr we look out of the box and see how we can um, uh, help address uh, some of their needs. One of the things that um, we do in the budget is, okay, make sure, and it's help the departments, identify what is your operations versus your one-time cost, because we do have reserves, um, and like I'm thinking vehicle fleet type purchases for sheriff is quite hefty. Um, so if that is a cost that we can cover through one-time um, resources versus looking for an ongoing source that's going to impact their operations, then uh, that's a move that we'll make. But we evaluate that each year, uh, determining, um, you know, what is that impact going to be and how can we minimize what that uh, is going to be to the public. Are you guys facing any pressure from the state of California or any sort of laws, regulations that are holding you back? The impacts that we, we have to evaluate that each year, and we have a, the state budget gets revised in May, so we wait for that. The preliminary budget that we've evaluated, um, one, of the, one of the things that we've had to build into our budget this year is regarding our in-home supportive services. It was um, typically what we're looking at as a state is where they're shifting a cost from them to us. Uh, so, and it happens quite often. Um, uh, our two biggest um, uh, state uh, receivers are our um, aging and adult type um, activity, our Department of Human Services, who handles our welfare aid. Um, that is uh, basically those two departments are the ones we're having to watch quite um, uh, frequently to see if there's going to be a cost that um, the county is now going to have to either increase a, pro a portion of what we're um, our uh, what we call MOEs or maintenance of effort is, is required to pay. So, uh, so yes, each year we're having to, to evaluate and sometimes that changes from the preliminary uh, on their, to their revise. So we're having to evaluate that again in a few months. But right now the, the major impact that we're having to build into the budget is related to our in-home supportive services. You keep mentioning one-time revenue sources. Can you like give some examples of what some of those one-time revenue sources are? Sure. If you get a grant that is a one-time uh, resource for a particular project or particular program, and it's not guaranteed every single year, that's one-time source to us. Our carry-forward. Each year we have a carry-forward, and it's. It, you budget to spend your whole budget, so you don't know if you're going to have 10 million left over, 20 million left over. So we look at that as a one-time source. There's a lot of agencies that have gotten into um, struggles because 
they assume in their budget that they're going to get guaranteed, like say a 20 million each year, and then something happens in, in their economy and they don't have that, yet they've built their ongoing operations um, with that funding. We did away with that about five years ago here at the county, and that's been very, um, as I said, pivotal really in helping us get through uh, this major loss of, of oil and gas revenue where we came up with a plan to reduce our operations in order to live at a level we can, that's sustainable. Uh, essentially, so uh, when you're when you're developing your budget with your operations based on these one-time sources, it really becomes a challenge if something if if you're losing a major source down the road. Public safety, and we've kind of touched on it, is the major challenge with, with public safety is a lot is driven on their MOU. And so it's all negotiated, and that's not a simple overnight um, type of, of activity. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly they want to provide the best service that um, they can. And, and when we're looking at negotiated type items, it becomes... Um, uh, you know, something we can't immediately fix. Um, right now, and one of those issues is, is pension. Uh, you know, unfortunately, they're in the higher bracket of our costs associated to pension, and um, what the board has, has uh, agreed to do is cover that escalation. So they're at least not having to focus on uh, the increase in pension costs. They just need to um, see if we can't find ways to manage differently, anywhere we can find effic efficiencies. Um, you know, that, that, that would be the ultimate goal. Yeah, and I think the, uh, an interesting way to look at it is if you're a two-income household and all of a sudden <clears throat> you lose one income, uh, you know, you got to make some changes and they're not going to be fun. Um, and, you know, I, we don't want to take money out of our employees' right. paychecks just as much as anybody. So, uh, but we all have to find a way to live within the means that we have uh, and not impact as many people as we, as we can. So... Uh, it's going to be a challenge as we sit down at the negotiating table and, and really work through this. Uh, you know, they're, uh, they're still going to get overtime. Um, they're still going to uh, um, receive a lot of uh, earnings in overtime. Uh, it's just the nature of their job. Uh, the question is, at what rate do we pay that? Do we pay that at the premium rate or do we pay it at, at the, the rate that we're required to by law? Uh, and, and you know it's gonna if we do go back down to that lower rate yeah it's gonna impact them a little bit but at this point we really are are at a loss of other solutions uh, to really uh, solve that structural deficit um, so that that's uh, we want to still be able to provide the service level we want to keep as many people in stations as we can but uh, to do that we have to to really find other ways to resolve that structural deficit yeah, they've been given that goal. Nancy, before you answer that, can you uh -huh. explain what BSI is for those? Students? Sure, it's called. It's a program that the board started many years ago called Budget Savings Incentives, and it only applies to general fund departments, and. Basically what it is is only it's not on their salaries and benefits, but if they um, have uh, not spent all of their appropriations in their um, services and supplies um, primarily, uh, then they get to carry over um, about 50% uh, of that um, into like a savings account for themselves to purchase, the intent was, one-time things, such as you, when you have to replace computers in your office, that's a one-time expense that um, perhaps you're not planning on that's, that's uh, operational. So um, that was the intent of it. What we've, because of the, the uh, fiscal situation we've been in, um, we've allowed departments to um, use some of that savings over a period of years to maintain um, a salary and benefits, so it covers some of the cost of um, uh, 
uh, of an ongoing expense. So we're about, um, I think we're at 13 million uh, around there is, is the total of that's divvied up to different departments, a portion of it. Uh, and we have about um, about three three and a half um, or so million being used towards um, salaries. And so what the challenge is is that you want to that the department needs to make sure that by the end of the four year time is up that either they have enough um, BSI to uh, continue keeping that person uh, through attrition or, or what have you, uh, another um, to find another source for that, um, or um, you know they're going to be looking at uh, um, a layoff or, or letting us know that there's going to be a significant uh, service level impact uh, if they're running out of BSI. So um, obviously, as the t budgets get smaller and smaller. Uh, typically BSI earnings will get lower and lower. Um, so yeah, they are using it, and um, uh, but so far we haven't had a problem um, from a department. We, we get the budget justifications here in April. We'll see if uh, we have any that are, are gonna be struggling, but we're constantly watching it because uh, it, 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 it's, it's not ideal to use that to, to pay for salaries and benefits. So we are at 11, so if there's any other quick questions? I still have a couple, uh, if that's OK. Um, that's OK. Right? <laughs> yeah. So as far as we're talking about, there's nothing else we could really do about the fire's salary. But going forward, we already uh, voted against a couple of new revenue sources with marijuana and then the, um, the concert. What are some of the things that the the county is thinking about as other revenue sources to try to find as to you know make up for these missed ends. Wants to take it. I, well, I can tell you what what um, I'm aware of because <coughs> typically we don't put anything in the budget uh, unless we know it's going to be received. So um, there's a lot of planning on um, economic development. We one of the things that we look um, have been that's been part of our. Um, review process is where can we um, make sure that our contracts are are we getting um, the true cost from other cities for example one of the one of the things we're looking at on the fire is their fire contracts with the cities are we recouping the the full cost of what it is to provide that service um, that's one. Uh, I know that um, on the property tax side, which w is a good thing for us, is that um, we're, we're seeing that for, for a long-term situation that oil and gas is just, it's gonna stay about where it's going to be, not only because um, of the price per barrel of oil, but there's a lot of other components to go into how the assessor assesses that. One of them is the reserves um, under the ground. So um, we're seeing those go down. So it's also impacting the assessor's value. But what we've seen is a significant increase in um, values for residential, commercial, and ag properties that are almost surpassing really what um, uh, uh, the increase in, in the oil and gas side is. So that's diversifying that type of um, collection. So anywhere we can do that, I know we've done, um, we're getting into, um, and it's not my, my project, but there's a, an advanced Kern um, uh, on the development tr side trying to get some um, big businesses in, into our area. That increases our sales tax and uh, other things that um, uh, help the value. Um, of Kern County. So uh, there's a lot of things that, that we're working on, mo both on um, finding efficiencies for cost reduction, but also where are these sources? We've really done um, a good job at the various departments looking at grants to fund um, big projects where we're not having to use general fund dollars. Parks is one of them. Um, that uh, has really looked to grant funding for a lot of the things that we're looking at. Um, and that's what we're going to have to continue to do, really uh, have the departments go see what's available for their type of programs um, and, uh, you know, have less reliance so much on the, our discretionary resources. Um, because that, that, that will be an ongoing challenge for us um, on the oil and gas where we really want to get out of that reliance um, on anticipating a high level of, of assessment from that anymore. 
Can you give any examples of some of those companies that you were um, talking about trying to get to come here to Kern County? Well, at this point, I think we would take anything. The Vance Current is trying to get them to have um, tax incentives to, to come into here. It's not, like I said, it's not one of my programs, but we probably find out if they're talking to anybody in particular. Yeah, so generally, um, the companies that we're talking to for economic development until they, they commit to being here, we don't disclose their name. Um, I know that Tillam Ranch is active in pursuing new uh, companies. Um, and they're, they're taking advantage of the incentives that Advanced Kern offers. Um, if I remember correctly, it's a, it's a formula, the incentive is a formula that takes the number of employees that you're bringing and the wage and the improvements, the capital improvements that you'll make to the area. So one of the requirements is that as you bring jobs to Kern County, as a new employer or an existing employer that's increasing the number of jobs, they have to be at or above the living wage so that those employees are not dependent on our services. Uh, so we're not, create, we're not adding jobs and then creating a drain on the system. We're actually uh, strengthening the system. As far as the park side goes, you guys doing anything else that you can add that can get revenue in so that the parks are making its own revenue and then you know, I guess more of budget neutral kind of stuff? The, uh, there are not really any concrete um, plans for improvements at this point. One of the, uh, one of the, one of the outputs from this parks improvement plan for Hart Park will be the analysis and we've challenged the consulting group and they've been selected because of, uh, because of their track record with um, uh, with parks types of improvements. W one of the challenges is finding uh, improvements that will increase revenue. It could be, th there could be, huh, I'm go out on a limb here, uh, it could be many, many things. One of them might be a performance venue, as an example. Um, something that can bring in acts or uh, that, that fees can be charged or not. Um, just a community good. Um, uh, but it's it's those type of uh, those types of venues um, or those type of amenities or improvements that could bring in uh, in revenues in not just Hart Park but other places as well. There's some you know increasing uh, increasing the the stays at our parks campgrounds as an example. That's Buena Vista and that's Kern River uh, the Kern River uh, campground area. Um, uh, but there are uh, capital improvements that provide something that can be a revenue generator. As far as the specifics, we'll see those in, um, uh, in April and May, really uh, kind of in a concrete form. Okay. Well, we'll call that a wrap. Thank you.